We're going to call the meeting to order. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'd ask for those in attendance who can remain standing to please remain standing for a, a moment of silence for Mr. Martin Weiss, who we lost, who had passed away on January 8th. We did do a celebration for him, and he was a, a long-term member of the Conservation Commission. Thank you. All right, I think our first order of business is minutes. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I move to approve the December 16, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz on the regular session minutes. Hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to review those. All, all of those in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the December 16, 2019 Executive Session Minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Unanimous? Yeah. Right. Surprise. <laughs> no, not really. Okay, so we have public comment. Can I, by show of hands, see who's here to speak on co public comment? Oh, that's not that many. Okay, so if you would mind, come to the podium and state your name and your address, and whoever would like to come forward. Hi, uh, I'm Andrea Spano, uh, 3 Hayward Farms Lane. And um, I just wanted to say that I had heard that Mr. Schultz is not going to be running for re-election next term for select board. So on behalf of myself and as a founder of one of the founders of uh, Defend Up Switch River Communities, I felt it was important to publicly say that um, thank you. Thank you for being accessible and you know generous with your time, um, willing to collaborate, and always being transparent. Um, and providing mentorship on, um, you know, on town procedures. And thank you for continuously advocating for what's best for North Reading or what you think is best for North Reading. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Good evening. I'm Jennifer Platt at Eight Hidden Pond Lane in North Reading. Um, members of the board, I just wanted to come here this evening and introduce myself to those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet. Um, as you may know, I'm a long-serving associate member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and I did want, I don't know if it's required or, or not, but I did put in a citizen's activity form. I wanted the board to know that I am very interested in being considered for full membership on the board. Uh, we've lost some long-standing members, all of them, so a total of uh, 75 years or more of service to the board. I uh, want to thank each and every one of those members for, for what they've done. It's been my pleasure to serve with them. And by way of background, I'm a practicing attorney, practice in Boston. I practice commercial real estate, zoning, land use, development. I've been practicing for over 25 years. I'm a resident of town for over 21 years. I've raised my family year here, have two boys who've gone through the high school. I've been on the zoning board as a way to stay connected with the town. I don't practice in town, um, so it's my way to stay connected and to give back, and I'm looking forward to that opportunity to continue. Um, really just wanted to come and have a chance to um, shake hands, as it were, with each of you and say hello. And if there's more information that you need, I'm glad to provide it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. 
Good evening and Happy New Year to everyone. Marcy Bailey, 21 Duane Drive. Um, I hope that you all had received a letter that I sent to you in, on December 20th regarding the last selectman's meeting. I believe it was the last time you met on December 16th. And the process undertaken to um, appoint or reappoint members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. As a former selectman, I was very concerned with um, the process, adherence to policy, and respect for volunteers in the town. And I just wanted to come tonight to hopefully have a little bit of a discussion about that. Um, when I served on the board, it seemed to be standard practice and in line with policy for liaisons to speak with chairs of committee, um, to speak with all interested parties and associate members of committees before choosing an appointment. Um, this is no disrespect to the person who was appointed, to the um, people who had served on the board, or to the board itself. But it's really concern about volunteers in this town and people who give a lot of time and I think deserve all our respect and discussion and um, an open, this is an open meeting, so an open discussion and the opportunity to attend when a, an appointment or an, an issue that's going to involve them and is probably going to be concer of concern to them to appear before the board. And when I watched the meeting, um, it was clear to me that that hadn't happened and that the majority of the board members didn't think that needed to happen because the vote went ahead. And um, I would just ask you to not reconsider the vote, but um, to address the policy, to, to look at the policy, to reaffirm the policy, and if you're not gonna stick with the policy, to have a discussion about that in open meeting and why that's not going to happen. I was surprised, I came tonight largely because it was not on the agenda. Um, I expected to see the policy on the agenda since it seemed to be, you know, issues surrounding that. So um, I would ask for any, f any feedback on that and I would ask the board um, to really reconsider that anyone on an appointed committee, board, or commission is, um, is a volunteer and I hope deserves your respect and the respect of all of us in town and the appreciation of all of us in town. Long-standing members, um, it's been standard practice for them to be honored by the board and to be thanked by the board and not to be summarily um, dismissed. And it is the board, I will agree 100% that you're the appointing authority and it's your right to appoint anyone that a majority of you decide on. So I don't have an issue with that, but I have an issue with the, the treatment um, and the adherence to policy. Um, in closing, I'd like to say that um, I am still on a few committees in town, and I would um, hope that you realize that I'm here representing myself, not other members of that committee, those committees, or not, um, not, not those boards as a whole. So um, thank you, and I, I hope that we can all do better going forward. Thank you. That comment, please. Anybody else here? May I respond? John Murphy, 13 Duane Drive. I'm here as a citizen, not as the town moderator. Um, I have to say that I'm a little um, dismayed by what I've seen happen recently in terms of appointments. I've sat where you sit. I've also sat on other boards and, and committees within the town. Um, and it, I just think that what has happened in this community, and so I'm speaking as a resident now, but I'm walking a fine line. Um, so hopefully I don't get in trouble or lambaste it in the paper, but I, personally, I don't care. Um, I think that um, what has happened is not respectful to the chairman of the committees, to, to the chairman of that committee, and um, I hope that this doesn't continue. Um, when, when I was sitting where you sit, I was involved in a situation where we had a change on a committee. The chairman knew, the committee member knew, um, everybody knew what was going to happen, and that's important. Communication, whether it's at my work, in my house, 
more importantly with my wife. Um, that's the most important thing. So people need to know that. And I think that what has happened will potentially deter others from stepping forward to volunteer. Because they will, the, the, the chairman sitting at home hearing that the recommendation was not adhered to. The chairman of the, I'm, I'm an appointing authority in the community. The chairman of the finance committee is here. If I have a phone conversation with her about an appointee to the finance committee, be it a full member or an associate member, and then I do something different, that's not good. And I need to, we as a community, we're small enough that we can have that communication and let people know where they stand and going forward. And as a prior speaker said, there's many, many years of experience that aren't involved in a critical, critical committee in this community as we go forward with the 40B project. And having been on this board when one of the first 40B projects went through, which was the central place, um, I actually wore a referee shirt and brought cards because we had a joint meeting and I was the liaison with the ZBA and the CPC. Um, that project went forward. It was beneficial to the community um, and it, my dad lives there today. So it's, we need to make sure that we communicate to the community and to the volunteers, to the people who give their time and effort. Um, and, and they're giving up family time, they're giving up sometimes work time to advocate for what they believe in. And we have associate members who have been on there for many, many years who have the experience and the knowledge and they're not even sitting members today. And to me, as a resident, as a citizen, I, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed. So I apologize if I've offended anyone, but this took me by surprise. And people need to know when the appointments are going forward, if they're not going to be reappointed, they need to know before the meeting. And the chair needs to know before the meeting. That's common courtesy. It's tough to do, but having been someone who's done it from your chair, that's what needs to be done so that we continue to have volunteers who act in the best interest of the community and who move us forward as a community. So thank you very much. Thank you. My name, excuse me, is Elizabeth Coolidge Stoltz. I live at Two Gillis Drive, and I didn't come with prepared comments, but sitting here this evening, I can think of three things that might be useful. My husband and I started coming to select board meetings a number of months ago. Um, I've enjoyed coming and have learned a lot simply by watching the processes through which you guys work. Um, I did not come simply because we didn't remember when the meeting was, um, to the meeting that's under scrutiny this evening. Um, so I can't make any personal comments about it. Um, but having seen a number that came before it, I can make some comments that might be useful as you post-mortem it. And I'm only using that phrase because I come from a medical background. And, and if I'm looking at my three fingers and, and thinking correctly, the three things were, um, the first is that um, I think Marcy Bailey made a very good point that um, it would be highly useful to take um, a good look, independent of that particular incident, uh, at the process by which um, the reappointments, new appointments, and liaison work with the major boards takes place and in particular, and possibly with um, a checklist um, to make sure that the communications are all done and then documented, um, that the process is secure. Um, and by, I don't mean secure as in <coughs> intelligence communications, but that everybody is communicated with 
and that there isn't a lapse because if everybody has the right expectation, then you're far less to have either a misunderstanding or something that possibly somebody could have perceived as more than a misunderstanding. Um, the second thing is the issue of context, and yes, um, with things like the 40B or other things that come around in times of tension or financial constraint, there are greater issues at play and possibly longer term sequelae at play, and so that makes it all the more important if it's possible to do a dispassionate um, analysis now that there may be more upside in the future uh, to doing it, and I don't remember what my third finger was, but um, I think my general point was that everybody knows that most people want to be fair and most people get involved one way or another, be it volunteerism or other, because they in some way feel part of a community and they want to do the right thing. Um, I just find that the more we have a somewhat flexible but well-established structure, the easier it becomes to do the right thing. And with checklists and other supports in place, the more likely it is that that gets done consistently over time and fewer people feel that there are things over which to develop misunderstandings. And those are my thoughts this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here for public comment? I didn't really want to be up here tonight. My name is William Smith. I live at uh, 2 Alston Road in North Reading. I've probably been on more boards than anybody in this entire town, at least 42 years of service I served on a board. When I watched the TV the other night and watched the transaction that was going on with this board, I was shocked. I, I just couldn't believe it. I watched it again and again and again to really hear what I saw, and uh, it was deplorable. It really was. The chairman lost complete com control of the meeting. She was slamming the, the uh, what do you call it, the gavel down time after time after time. I couldn't get any control. That meeting should have been continued to tonight so that everybody could have their fair say. And it never, ha it never happened. Um, like I said before, I've known Paul personally for probably 30 or 40 years. And I served on, hi Mark. Um, <laughs> I've uh, known a lot of these guys that are on these boards and they're, they're good, they're people that serve the community, serve the community well for year after year after year. And to have that type of a situation, I, 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 it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to the town. And believe me when I tell you, the town is a big loser on this one. There's a lot of key issues coming up that that board was in charge of handling the, the legal, legality parts of it. And I don't know who the new guy is that became chairman or was the guy appointed. But Jennifer Platt that was on here and spoke earlier, she's been with that board for I don't know how many years, 12 years? Jennifer, where were you? 14. Huh? 14. 14. Uh, she, she was on that board as an alternate member and wanted to be appointed. Never even was considered. They just jumped right over and went to, to, this, to this Mr. Breen or whatever his name is. He's probably a good guy. He's probably a good candidate. But the way it was done was horrible. Um, I didn't want to have to be the one to say that, but I, somebody had to say it. But it's got to be brought to your attention. I thought that was very, very deplorable. They had an opportunity, uh, Mr. O'Leary and, and I don't know this fellow here, but they, they made a motion to the <laughs> chairman of the board, <laughs> to the chairman of the board to continue it to tonight so that everything could be done in a, in a, a, a reasonable manner. But um, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Anybody else here for public comment? Right, we are on to next order of business, which is board member reports. Oh, Mr. O'Leary. Oh, sorry. Can I comment? To what we've heard? If you want to use your board you member, can have a board member report. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, you can use your board member. 
Mr. O'Leary. Well, I guess I'll use my board member report then to, to comment on, on the comments too. And I, 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 again, I appreciate uh, people coming forward uh, with their comments. I appreciate the correspondence that the board has received uh, in relation to the issue uh, that was discussed last meeting and I guess this meeting too. And uh, it's not easy sometimes to be uh, critical of board members or but, but they saw it was important to come forward. Just to uh, let the board know, you know, since our last meeting, I have heard from several members of the public regarding the board's most recent actions on appointments and reappointments, uh, specifically the Zoning Board of Appeals. I have heard from no less than five former members of this board, uh, current and former elected members of other boards, appointed current and past uh, town officials, business people, and our <coughs> regular constituents uh, consisting of both long-term and short-term residents and voters. The reaction has been remarkably similar and repetitive. Uh, the appearance of a predetermined and orchestrated effort by a majority of this board showed a grievous amount of lack of respect, appreciation, common decency, and courtesies. Characterized as unfortunate and uh, may have long-term damaged the town's ability to attract and retain volunteers. This is embarrassing and a stain on the board. And it was also uh, so very avoidable. Several individuals have written letters uh, to the editor and to this board. The correspondence to this board should be read into the record along with uh, the letters of resignation from Mr. Dimitri and Mr. Keyes. The theme is the same. Some of the previously mentioned individuals, while expressing these concerns to me personally, are reluctant to come forward with public comment for fear of reprisals. They're business people who have licenses and permits to come before this board, and people who uh, currently volunteer and serve on boards and committees which require funding and support. They're concerned that comments uh, the comments may be uh, adversely impact their livelihoods you know, or the mission and funding of the uh, programs they're passionate about. People should not be afraid to be constructively critical of this board or our actions. Yet they are. This is wrong and we must do something about it. This past week, I attended the Board of Appeals meeting uh, as a former liaison for over 20 years and uh, current 40B liaison for two reasons. The first, to get an update on the status of the 40B from town council, and the second primary reason was to thank Mr. Dimitri and Mr. Keyes for their dedicated service to the board and the community. I told them that I appreciated all of their sacrifice and service, respected them both, and understood the difficult position they were put in and the difficult decision they believed they had to make based upon principle, respect, and association. I apologized for not being able to effectively articulate and convince the majority of our board to follow policy and respect the volunteers serving on, on their board. I spoke directly and publicly to the associate members. All three were present, who were passed over and ignored for consideration and asked them to stick with us. I told them that we needed them. The associate members know, know best the impact of this board's decision is having on their board. 87 years of knowledge and experience just exited that board. They know the impact. I hope they stay. I hope this board has enough sense and decency not to overlook these people again. I also met for the first time and welcomed Mr. Breen to the Board of Appeals. I thanked him for his willingness to volunteer and serve and wished him a long and successful tenure on the board. So where do we go from here? As one member of this board, I need to know how the majority is going to proceed going forward. Appointees, current and future, have a right and need to know. Are the board's current policies, procedures, and practices, and yes, they do exist, contrary to what some members have stated, they do exist, you know, are they going to be followed and adhered to, or scrapped, or modified? Will the majority be offering their most recent actions as the policy and practices moving forward? What obligation do we have as a board you know, have to those willing to sacrifice and serve? Do we let them know 
I'll let them watch it un unfold embarrassingly on television or read about it in the newspaper or receive a text or a tweet. For our associate members who also sacrifice and serve and do their time and learn the intricacies and responsibilities over time, are we going to ignore them? Let them learn that their service and sacrifice is unappreciated and for naught because a political ally shows a sudden interest in a seat or a spot that they, the associate member, has been committed to for years. The current policy needs some updates and clarification to leave no room for misunderstandings. The updated policy needs to address associate members and their value. The policy needs to further clarify the role and responsibility of liaisons and the chairman's responsibility and procedures to handle complaints or concerns about liaisons. So as a board, we have made some missteps that require some corrective action. Last week, I requested through the town administrator that this policy review be included on the agenda because we have some important and critical appointments to make on the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Conservation Commission. The chair decided no, it would not be on the agenda. I also requested that we recognize the now past three members of the Zoning Board of Appeals for their combined 87 years of service. The answer was also no. So I await the, the majority's responses and action. Moving forward, will it be with respect, <coughs> dignity, appreciation, reputational concern, and transparency, or ignorance and ignoring all of the above? To me, ignorance is no excuse, and I await my colleagues' efforts in response to address it. Thank you. Mr. Walner. Um, that was very good. <laughs> I wish I had written it myself. Um, the most important thing we have in this town is the volunteers that show up for our committees and give their time and effort. And anything, our objective as a board is to support those volunteers and make it a good experience. Nothing could be further from the truth than what happened on the December 16th. That is not how we reward and support our volunteers. To me, I'm a people person. This is very upsetting, and uh, it's, it demands action. Yeah, I really appreciate that Marcy Bailey came forward with a very precise letter. I appreciate that William Bellavance, who's also been a uh, volunteer in town, came through with a similar letter of not appreciating what's going on. Uh, Jim Dimitri, who I know personally, have known for years just from our sons, uh, also expressed great disappointment in what happened. And then we have uh, Joe Keyes, who also was from that board, who expressed the same concern. I am a people person, but also at one point I was a uh, quality control, quality assurance uh, person. And so for 12 years, when you have mistakes go wrong, you do dig into your policies and procedures. So I actually have printed out the policies and procedures we're supposed to be following. I'm going to hand it out to all the members because until we resolve this, it's not satisfactory. We do need to tighten up our procedures. It's very unfortunate, however, that we have to be talking about procedures when it should just be professional conduct and attitude that we approach people with um, courtesy, respect, and dignity. We don't need procedures to do that, but since we have failed, we need to do that, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure these policies are reviewed and uh, followed, and that we try to put people on the board who are adults and can be reasonable about how we handle our, our, our volunteers and our duties. Thank you, and I will hand this out. Uh, just real brief, I stand behind the procedure we have, and I stand behind my vote. Thank you. I also have written some things. So, um, I strongly stand by my vote and my decision to appoint Mr. Breen. It was based on his exemplary credentials. I do not take any decision I make on this board lightly. I come here prepared and more than capable to make my own decisions. Unfortunately, the vote went differently than some people wanted it to, but the policy was followed. I'm going to respond to letters that were written to us. If they're not present, I'm sure they're watching. Mr. Dimitri, I thank you for your service. 
but did not appreciate your unnecessary slander of members of this board on your way out. It was unfortunate. Mrs. Bailey, you also felt the need to slander members of this board in your letter. The gist of your dramatic letter in which you were aghast was comparing courtesy over policy. If that's the road we're traveling, then Mr. Steve O'Leary should have recused himself from voting or discussing his brother's vote. Mr. Schultz did just that when his wife's vote came up for youth services. It's not policy, since her position's also volunteer, but it was the courteous thing to do. Mr. Keyes falsely accused three of the members of obviously, he said, planning to appoint a person prior to the meeting. I took that as a personal attack and defamation of my character. He also mem mentioned courtesy over policy, yet said nothing about Mr. O'Leary voting for his brother. Mr. Bellavance, his letter offended me the most. He accused member of this board of voting on something without being informed. Mr. Bellavance, if you're watching, for your information, for personal reasons in the past, I spent countless hours attending meetings of many of these committees and boards. I know how they work. I'm very familiar with the members, including Paul O'Leary. I also made several trips here speaking with Karen and Jane, educating myself on this process. What was most offensive about the letter was the statement that we shouldn't just vote what the person next to us votes. Considering the letters in defense of Paul, the statement was aimed at either myself or Kate or both of us. So he was implying that we can't make our own decisions, that we need the man next to us to tell us how to vote. Well, that accusation could have been pointed at Mr. Walner, who hadn't even read Mr. Breen's citizen activity form. Yet it was put towards us. Also in his letter, he said that we should get our facts straight. Well, I would say the same to him. In closing, I'd like to thank him for disclosing that he's Jim Dimitri's cousin. It made things very clear. And I will end with that. Thank you. And I'm just going to, I have a number of public service announcements and things that I have to report to you on, but I do want to just read in, in light of the innuendo with regard to all of the accusations of this board and, you know, <coughs> failure to comply and things like that. Town Council has weighed in, so I think it's important to um, explain the opinion that was presented. Um, Massachusetts General Law 48 Section 12 makes clear that the Select Board is the legal appointing authority for all members of the ZBA. This is further codified in Section 3-4-1 of the Town Charter, which clearly states the Select Board has the authority to appoint members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. In my opinion, the Select Board's policies are advisory or directory, but no, do not legally require that a certain procedure be utilized, nor does it usurp the Select Board's legal, inherent, and broad appointing authority that is expressly conferred to them under the Town Charter and Massachusetts General Laws. This is further evidenced by the fact that it is my understanding that the process set forth in Section 3.2 of the Select Board's policies has rarely, if ever, been utilized or followed by the Select Board in recent years for other appointments that arguably would fall under the same policy. It is notable that neither General Laws Chapter 48, Section 12, nor the Town Charter require the Select Board to receive a recommendation from the sitting ZBA chair. It is also worth pointing out that the board policies do not carry the same weight nor have similar legal effect as general law, town charter provision, town bylaw, or even a local rule or regulation. Moreover, the select board, in my opinion, additionally has the right at any time to waive its own policies, which the select board implicitly did when it voted on the ZBA appointments on December 16th. Um, in terms of what vote that the board took, um, I, 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 would, I don't want to have to repeat what my colleague has said, but um, I, I too have received immeasurable feedback from people. Um, and we, could, we can't control what the reporter reported. She was doing her job to try to drive readers to the paper, and she did. She also, as, a, as another ripple effect, had, a, had something that's refreshing. She had people actually watch the rebroadcast or watch, the, watch our meeting which we don't really usually have this type of an audience at. 
Um, but nevertheless, we got a, a lot of feedback, and I, I will, for the time that I'm remaining here, upend the notion that someone has to sit in a seat as an associate member and pay her dues in order to become appointed as a regular voting member. I'm going to upend the notion that a chair has to pay her dues in order to serve as a chair of a board over and above someone who might be there for year after year after year after year. What, high, what this did highlight for me is that people don't want to come forward and fill out that citizen activity form. They want to serve, but they don't think they have a fair or equitable chance to serve because of the notion that someone has to pay their dues. If we had a qualified individual to come forward, we're waiting for you, come forward. We had the, the individual that's <coughs> serving come forward and say, I'm interested in serving as a voting member. We had another member of that board write us a letter and said, I'm not interested. There will be positions available. There are positions available because of the resignations that the board received. Please, for people that are watching, come forward. Let us know who you are. Give us your qualifications. Fill out the form. <coughs> There'll be positions available for you to serve in. This town is made on the backs of volunteers. We've said it, I've said it over and over again at every board meeting that I've been at. So we do know that there are people out there, and this has highlighted and underscored the fact that people may not want to come forward, and we hope that you do come forward. Fill out the form and be considered. Um, and the second thing I'd like to add to that is, I did see the letters. I don't need to be told how to vote. I do have, I am informed when I come here. I don't need anybody to the left of me to tell me how to vote. I know a lot of people don't know Mrs. Gonzalez yet. She may be quiet and reserved, but when she does speak her mind, and I don't always agree with her, but when she does speak her mind, it's her own mind, and she has a, the ability to speak for herself, even though I'm speaking for her right now, <laughs> and so do I. So I did not appreciate it, and I found it offensive that I would have to be told how to vote by a colleague of mine, or that I would just vote what the guy next to me votes, because that's not how anyone that watches us in operation operates here. So that's the end of the discussion on that. And I would like to update you on a number of different things that are, um, that have, that need to be addressed really quickly. One of them is the, the PSA on the water. We do have our um, directors here to discuss that with you. Um, but we did have a PSA go out with regard to water testing, um, and that had to do with contaminants that were found in the West Elm, um, the West Elm, the PFA, PFASs are contaminate, contaminants which are considered to be health concerns, and that's likely why the current regulations, even though we meet the current guidelines, the current regulations are being modified to become more stringent. Um, in the recent months, based on um, certain considerations, the, the town has tested and determined that the elevated levels, even though they meet the current guidelines, they would not meet the proposed guidelines. So a public service announcement has gone out. And in the meantime, that treatment plant and another treatment plant have been taken offline, which means they're out of service while they're being while maintenance is occurring. So we do have our expert and our director here to discuss that further, and I'm sure many people are, are wondering and concerned about that, but they are here to, to, to talk about that more. The town has also <coughs> placed that information on the website, and, and I believe it's, it'll be published in the paper as well. Um, it was last week. Yes, and, and if there's any more information that people need, they can come to the website and really contact the the director if they want a little bit more information. We have another item on the agenda that we, we had addressed in executive session, which, which has to do with a turkey farm. And just to give a quick and brief summary of that, the, the town has the right to acquire a property that's been classified as farmland. Um, we have an option, a, a right of first refusal, so to speak, under the statute. We have discussed that, and for, for legal reasons, can't really discuss it broadly, but to let the town know that there, there will be public hearings 
there will be further public hearings on that so the people from the public can come and talk to the board. Um, we have the right to exercise an option to purchase. The reason why we have to address it now is there's a very, very small window of time within which to do that. However, there are steps under the statute that we will be complying with, which includes a public hearing, posted public hearing, so members of the public can come and talk to us about that um, acquisition. So the next steps will be sending a notice. There's an issue with a notice to sell that we received that has what we believe is deficiency. So we're going to be sending a deficiency notice. Nevertheless, we, we expect to receive a corrected notice and then to move forward with the public hearing process. Um, and then we have another matter with regard to plastic, plastic bag bans, which most of our um, community is aware of went into effect and most of our businesses um, are aware of and complying with and town officials have gone visiting different establishments with regard to compliance with that. There'll be a 90 day grace period um, that we're in in terms of enforcement of that because it's sort of the, the date came upon us rather quickly so we want to just make sure everybody is in line and understanding as a copy of that and is in compliance with that. And Mr. Gilbert, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. I know you have your own reports at the end of this, but while we have people here that might be that might be helpful in terms of enforcement, next that, steps. No, so that's correct. Uh, we are, uh, through the health director, uh, going to be visiting establishments over the next three months to uh, educate, get into compliance, and there are a number of businesses already here in town, small and large, that are complying, and those of you here in town who shop in town have probably seen that. Um, but we are we're, you know, looking to continue to work with the business community to educate more than anything else. Now, I will stress that there is an option um, for a, a bag that is compliant with the American Society for Testing and Materials standard for compostable plastics that businesses do have the opportunity to uh, pursue if they so wish. I'll also note uh, that the uh, North Reading Food Pantry is selling reusable uh, purple shopping bags for $10. They're available at the Senior Center and at the Union Congregational Church. There are a number of businesses that have been giving away bags as well. And the Friends of Flint Memorial Library are also planning to sell shopping bags for fundraising purposes. And finally, North Reading Parks and Recreation uh, has a, a pretty extensive program called North Reading Welcomes where they provide um, information about North Reading to new, new residents and that actually comes in a reusable bag. So um, there are some options that are out there um, with regard to, uh, to this and um, I more wanted to make the community aware that if you see in a situation uh, where somebody's not complying, certainly feel free to reach, reach out to the health department to let them know and we'll make sure we step up our information but um, we aren't issuing the fines at this point in time. It won't be until uh, March 31st or April 1st. And then the bylaw, you can find the bylaw on the website as well for more specifics. That's correct. Okay. All right. That's, that's it. Next, no, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just I'd like to also mention uh, one of the reports is that uh, Mr. Tim Allen has uh, resigned from the Conservation Commission. Uh, we were going to honor him here this evening. He was on the preliminary agenda. Uh, but he flew out of town on Saturday, and I had the opportunity, along with the town administrator, to attend the um, Conservation Commission meeting uh, Wednesday, uh, presented with a citation, uh, appreciating his uh, acknowledging and appreciation of his 16 years' worth of service. Um, as you recall, my colleagues recall at the last meeting, um, when we did the appointments to the Conservation Commission, uh, I asked to leave one associate membership uh, slot open and put the board on notice that there was an impending uh, resignation which would create a vacancy for a full membership uh, there and that there would probably then be the need for two associates to be appointed. So uh, again, in, in light of, of all that's uh, transpired here, um, my question uh, through the chair uh, is, you know, is there going to be a review of our policies and procedures in relation to appointments and reappointments and consideration of associate members you know, on our agenda, um, first and foremost, will we be t discussing it? I, I think we've discussed it. I think if an associate member wants to step forward, step forward so, so and say, I'd like to be, my I'd question like is, to is the board just going like to the be, policy is. is, is, if, the, is you want the, to, if you're interested in an appointment, let us know. Step forward and let us know. But what if procedures some, are we to follow? Because what we did at the last meeting was different. And appears the majority 
thinks that's okay. So what I just want to know, is the board going to be discussing policies and procedures and expectations of liaisons, I'm a liaison, I have a job to do here, you know, what is it that you're expecting of me as a liaison? What can the associate members and other members of the public, like a lady sitting right over here who put her name in for Conservation Commission, what could she expect as to how her application is going to be handled by this board and how can they be assured that all of them will be considered for nomination and consideration? <coughs> because that's not what's happened. And we've had a reiteration by all three members here, the three majority people here that probably handled it last week, that you're okay with what happened and how we're doing it. We didn't consider associate members. I can tell you right Steve, now. Steve, they have to apply. I, we can only me, vote on already applied, Excuse me, they've already applied and they're already serving. They're not again, my recommendation would be, again, to, to elevate, and again, the recommendation of, of the chair of the Conservation Commission is to elevate an associate member who's been serving there for a period of time to learn the policies, procedures, and all the rest, and all the nuances and the issues that have been, been sitting in as an associate member to be elevated. But I can't assure them that that's gonna, going to take place. So. My no, question. You, you can't assure a vote in advance. No, no I'm not assuring a vote in advance. I'm assuring a consideration. The five members I have, who is, I'm sitting here. Who is asking to be considered for I am sitting here. I, as I don't a long know time how member, to. I have I no idea. I'm sure. Thank you. I, I have no idea what's expected of me as a liaison by the majority of this board at this particular time. So I'm asking, I'm looking for some guidance. So again, I'm at, are we going to revisit I'm, our I'm, policy? I'm confused. Is this is this part of your board member yes, report? Yes, I'm okay. reporting that I have a, okay. a resignation. So you have a, I have a resignation, and you have an I, application. I get, we're right there on behalf of the so board. So are you and nominating them. that person for consideration? Asking, you know that has to go on the agenda. I also ask, but I'm asking, are we going to be on the agenda discussing the policies that we that are in question here? It, there aren't policies meeting. in question other than by you and Mr. Walner. You didn't so, follow them. First of all, you didn't even know we were there. The last right. meeting, this every single one, no, excuse me, every order. single one of you said You're that the policies order. didn't exist. You're you said out. they didn't exist. No, no not out. one single person said that. Re -look at You're the, out of order. Re -look at if it. you have a name and no, you want no. it to be considered for appointment, if put you it recall, in nomination. At the last meeting, I put everybody's name Any forward. Any vacancy that exists that someone puts their name forward on, the liaison so, interviews so that potential candidate and then offers and nominates, and that's the policy that we follow. Does the majority of the board wish to hear the recommendation of a board or committee or commission chair, along with the liaisons? Do you wish to hear that? We can. That's what our policy says should happen. That, no, well, that's what happened so, when we voted last week. We knew Mr. Dimitri's <laughs> recommendation by the time we voted. So no, why yeah, are you going to stand after, right now? after he had to text Steve, it, you said Steve. that you did. You said you didn't right. ask him, and you Let's said go. you didn't. You didn't. Yeah. So All right. I'm just this asking. Is, this is what do you want me to do? I think what you, you know like what to do? do. You've been here. Long oh, enough. I know. I mean, I've, I've been doing Let's the same go. thing for yeah. a long time. All right. So, 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 Madam Chair, just a quick question again: Are we going to have any discussion of the policy? We're going to end this discussion. So now. the answer is no? The answer is no. Thank you. If you, you. have a name and nomination, for. put That's it in nomination. If you're nominating a candidate yeah. for an available position, that has to be docketed. That has to be discussed at one of our meetings. <coughs> and that no, has no to be kidding. put to a vote. It's as simple as that. But if the liaison doesn't put them all forward, they're not docketed and they don't count because they weren't all put forward last time. Who was it? Where were they? No associate members were even put forward they for consideration. Have did they, did they fill to up the activity form? You know, what? You know that. Did, Stop transcending, please. Activity we're form? moving on to the Thank next, you. next order of business. Thank you. You've answered my question. Next ask? order of business. I, I next order of business. Right. We have our directors here to give us a, a water and wastewater update, which will hopefully involve expansion of services as well as a little bit of information on the public yeah, service. Okay. Now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Patrick Barra, <laughs> Director of Public Works. Thank you for the opportunity to appear tonight and give you an update on water and wastewater, uh, our water and wastewater efforts in town. Um, with me tonight is Mark Clark. He's the water superintendent, as you know, and Rob Williamson from Wright Pierce. He's our engineering consultant. Um, you mentioned um, we had had some PFAS sampling done at the West Village Water Treatment yeah, Plant. Right here from the conversation outside. I can't hear anything. Fine. They're talking. I can't hear them. Please so we, continue. Thank you. Please. 
So we have those results back, and you know, I'll ask Mark in a second to give us an update on that and a bit of an education on PFAS. Um, also, uh, Rob's here to give us an update on our water connection with Andover. As you know, we're trying to uh, make some improvements in the system in order to uh, facilitate the connection to Andover and accept 100% of their water at some point in the future, uh, possibly a lot more, a lot sooner than we had anticipated. And then briefly, uh, in regards to wastewater, um, the, the water and wastewater group that meets um, frequently uh, all agrees that the next step in that effort is to go to Andover and discuss with them the infrastructure needs that they have that we will need in order to connect to the GLSD. So ultimately, our, our wastewater here in town will go through Andover on its way to GLSD where it'll, where it'll be treated. So we're meeting with um, my counterpart in Andover and his consultant on Wednesday. Uh, the three of us here as well as some, the, the town engineer, and we're going to hash that out and have sort of a workshop and, and, and I'll certainly bring whatever we learn from that meeting back here next time and give you an update on that. So I think I'd like to ask Mark to come up first. He's got a, a presentation on PFAS. He's going to discuss the results and then um, what he has to say uh, has implications on what Rob's going to tell you. So I think it makes sense to have Mark up first. So this is Mark Clark. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, board. for the delay. I, again, I'm Mark Clark. I'm the water superintendent here in town. Um, some of you may be familiar, PFAS has become kind of the buzzword in the drinking water industry. Uh, it's one of these emerge, what they call emerging contaminants. It's something that hasn't been necessarily tested for historically. Uh, there's what they call the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. We're on the fourth stage of that right now, but about four years ago, the third round of that, the federal government proposed that all water systems collect samples for these PFAS in their water. We did collect those samples back in 2014 and 2015, um, and they basically came up undetected at that time. What has happened is the federal government's lowered the standards, the ability to test for this in drinking water is to a much lower concentration now than it was even four and five years ago. And uh, some of the reports that came out, I believe back in October, there was a report of a, a landfill in New Hampshire that was basically the, the leachate, the, the liquid coming out the bottom of that landfill was being trucked to uh, the greater or the low, low wastewater treatment plant and discharged there. And uh, that caused some concerns because there were some considerably high, uh, fairly high levels that they were reporting. So I want to talk us through this issue a little bit. This did go on the website last Wednesday, I believe. It was in the paper last Thursday. This presentation should pretty much echo that. Um, there's a little bit of chemistry here, which I'm sure everyone loves in, in night school. But uh, just to show you where we are. So both us and Andover did test our water for PFAS. We both found some level of PFAS in the drinking water. They are not above the current drinking water standards for PFAS. However, the state has proposed a much lower standard for PFAS. And one of the samples we took is above, is slightly above that new proposed standard. So just quickly to go through this, uh, I'll try not to get too technical, but what are PFAS is? It's a short name, there's a group called per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So that's where the PFAS comes from. Uh, there's a group of six of them that historically they've looked at in terms of drinking water. Um, they're man-made chemicals. They're not naturally occurring chemicals. They're uh, man-made, they began to be, they first developed in the 1940s. Um, probably the two most familiar versions of them, they were used in the production of Teflon. They were used in Scotch Guard that was used on carpeting, used in uh, clothing, used in um, you know, vehicle fabrics. So they're pretty widespread. Um, the other area they were found to be very effective, so there were people dying on Navy ships due to fires, and they wanted to come up with a way to basically contain those fires in a much quicker uh, means. And PFAS were found to be very effective. They're basically a, kind of what they call a wetting agent. They basically grab onto the fire and they put it out much quicker. So they began to be used on Navy ships. They've also been used at airports. They've also been used if you go to a firefighting academy. Um, 
So they're widely used in uh, putting out fires at this time as well. They have a, a great ability to repel water, to protect surfaces, to resist heat. So they have a lot of industrial applications. And because of that, over the last 50 or 60 years, they've been very widespread in the, uh, in the country. How do they end up in drinking water? So there has to be a potential source of PFAS contamination in the vicinity of the water supply. So we talked about uh, <coughs> the landfill up in New Hampshire, the, the liquid that comes out the bottom of that, as the rain and whatever passes down through that, it can pick up small amounts of these PFAS, they come out the bottom of the landfill. There's one source. Airfields where they've had fires and they've used these firefighting foams, fire training academies, uh, if there's a manufacturer making PFAS in the area, it can show up as that. Um, not that this was PFAS, but a lot of us are familiar with the Stickney Well. So there was use of trichloroethylene in the vicinity of the Stickney Well prior to 1978. When we began testing for uh, trichloroethylene, that was one of the early contaminants we looked at, found it in the Stickney Well, and traced it back to there was a GE plant right over the line in Wilmington. Same type thing. If there's a manufacturing facility that <coughs> has uh, a floor drain or something that's not containing it properly, uh, waste disposal sites and landfills are good, you know, good sources for PFAS showing up. Um, they're very resistant to natural breakdown. So the same thing that makes them good for keeping stains off carpet or repelling water, they're very resistant to breakdown. So if you deposit, say, a roll of carpet in a landfill, the carpet fibers eventually are going to break down. But the, the PFAS, that man-made chemical, doesn't degrade. So it comes off the carpet fibers, it gets into the groundwater, and eventually makes its way you know, out into the environment. Um, what are the health effects of, of PFAS? So in laboratory animals, they've been uh, linked to, de you know, de developmental delays. Um, they've traced them to effects on some of our organs, the thyroid, the liver, kidneys. Uh, certain hormones are, and immune systems are impacted. And there is a potential. It hasn't been fully demonstrated, but there's a potential that they can cause cancer as well. So <clears throat> while they have some definite benefits to us, they cause some huge issues for us. Um, so what are the levels that they, uh, is considered safe in drinking water? Typically in drinking water, we have what we call a maximum contaminant level. So uh, the federal government will set it. They, they look at uh, if you consume two liters of water a day over the course of a lifetime, 70 or 80 years of drinking that water, what level of contamination in the drinking water is safe, will not cause health effects to human beings. And you, they use that to develop what they call a maximum contaminant level in drinking water. There is not and there never has been an MCL for PFAS in the drinking water. So in 2014 and 15, most water systems tested. In 2016, the EPA came back and they issued what they call a health advisory. And they set a level at 70 parts per trillion of uh, <coughs> PFOS and PFOA. Those are two of the six PFAS contaminants. Um, in June of 2018, the state looked at it and they took five of the PFAS contaminants and they issued a health guideline that it should be less than 70. And just last month, the end of last month, the Mass DEP has started the MCL process where they're looking at six of the PFAS compounds and they're looking at setting the level from 70 down to 20 parts per trillion. So what is a part per trillion? Um, most drinking water contaminants are, are regulated at parts per million. So a part per million would be if you had one molecule of something in one million molecules of water. A part per trillion is a million times smaller than that. So if you had one part in a million million molecules of water, a trillion is a million million. So it's a, it's a very small level. Um, I believe there's only one other drinking water standard that gets down to the part per trillion level in terms of, of defining them. So they're looking at very, very low levels of these PFAS in drinking water. So have we tested for it? Yes, we tested back in 2014 and 2015. Our results came back as not detected for each of the six PFAS compounds at the source that, at that time. Again, as I just mentioned, the, the analytical ability to test to a much lower level is now present. Um, after this 2014-15 testing, then we had this 2016, the federal government came in and lowered their level. Mass lowered it, and Mass is considering lowering it again. And you, you'll, you'll hear a number of states are doing different things. New Hampshire's taking an even more proactive uh, role in this. So this. This stuff is hard to read, but what it's basically showing is what were the levels we found back in 2014 and 15. ND means it wasn't detected. It was below the detection limit. But the problem is, and these are in parts per billion, to get to parts per trillion, you've got to move this detection level 
decimal point over three places. So that top one, the detection level at the time was 40 parts per trillion. If you're looking at that, they range from 10 to 90 parts per trillion. If the new standard is 20 parts per trillion and you can only test to 90 parts per trillion, you're not down to a low enough standard. So here is the more recent sampling we've done. Um, and basically I'm showing you there's two samples the town took and there's three samples that Andover took in the water here. So we have our West Village water treatment plant, we have our, one of our Andover interconnections, and then Andover tested what they call their raw water, which is the water coming into their treatment plant, and then they took two tests of their finished water, which is the water leaving their treatment plant. So the federal government standard of 70 parts per billion, we're all below that. So North Reading's well, 16.8, Andover's water coming out of their treatment plant is somewhere just below four parts per trillion, again, compared to a standard of 70. Um, the sum of five that the, the mass DEP is looking at, again, we're all, all those samples were below that. Where we're looking at is mass DEP's proposing an MCL of 20 parts per trillion. <coughs> we're at 22.6, the one sample we took in town. So 20 is the standard, the proposed standard, 22.6, we're slightly above that proposed standard. So what steps are being taken? At this point, uh, we've ta we're taking additional samples. We collected 14 different samples, so we had tested two sites. Typically with drinking water samples, you test what's coming out of your water treatment plant. If it's not present in what's coming out of your water treatment plant, it, it can't form itself in the system. So the theory is if you're testing it there, that's where you need to test. What we opted to do was go back to the raw water. So if we have four wells, it's possible that each of those wells have a different level of PFAS contamination in them. So to try to more fully identify where the, where the PFAS is coming from, we've sampled all our raw water wells. We also resampled the water coming out of our two different treatment plants. We've resampled the two interconnections. So we have interconnections with Andover on Main Street and over on Central Street. So we wanted to sample the water coming in from Andover. Um, and then we want to do, do kind of a distribution system sample. So we took a sample here at Town Hall. <coughs> on the east side of town, we took a sample at our Swan Pond water storage tank. And then we opted to test also the four uh, schools just to see what the water was like in the schools. Six weeks will be the time frame until we get the, the, the results back. So basically, labs have two weeks to do what they call an extraction, where they take that water out and they make it ready to be tested, and then they have an additional four weeks to test that. As I said at the beginning, PFAS is a buzz, buzzword in drinking water, so the labs are basically backed up, and they're just meeting those time frames. So we sent them samples the uh, middle of last week. It's going to take six weeks, basically, is what they're telling us for us to get those results back down. Uh, when we do get those results, we're going to sit down, review them in-house, review them with our consultant, we'll review them with Mass DEP, and determine what steps we can take. Um, as has been mentioned, our, well, our wells and our water treatment plant are, are not putting any water into the system. We have winter maintenance, we normally do. This is our low demand time of the year. We have to, uh, what they call, redevelop the wells, so we're offline to do that right now. The wells will stay offline at least until we go through this six week and get those results back and figure out where we're going from there. Um, just really quickly, where did we test? Just It's hard to see this, but the two red dots are the two Andover interconnections. Um, the green dots, which are, so all our sources in, North, in Andover are all in the northwest corner of town. So we sampled our, our wells, which are the green dots. The two blue dots close to the wells are our water treatment plants. And then there are six kind of black dots that kind of go across town. Again, those are the schools, their town hall, and their our, uh, water treatment plant. We would not expect to see levels in the distribution system any higher than what we see at our sources. So uh, we would expect it, and again, we'll share all these results with you when we get them, but we would expect those results should be um, fairly low, probably comparable to what we're seeing come in from Andover. The good news, kind of the good news is all the samples taken from Andover have been well below the, uh, even the proposed limit. So if the proposed limit is uh, 20 parts per billion, Andover's results and our results were four to six parts per trillion. So we're a factor of three below that. I'm just going to throw this out there too. So there are multiple factors of safety built into these drinking water standards. So they don't, don't find what causes cancer in a, in a laboratory mouse and you know, multiply that by the weight difference between a mouse and a human and set that as a drinking water standard. They apply multiple factors of safety on the order of 10 times 10 times 10 to get those drinking water standards down, to just make sure we're protecting the uh, 
kind of the most, most vulnerable people in the population. Um, so that's kind of how they backdoor into the, the 20 parts per drillion. Um, Mark, can you remind everybody about how much water we take from Andover on a typical day and <clears throat> So on a, typical, on a typical day or on a typical year, we've already been taking about 70% of our water from the town of Andover. Only about 30% of it has come from our own wells. Um, and just to echo what Pax, Pat had said, and I'm sure the board is aware, most of the public are aware, we've already committed to purchasing 100% of our water from Andover by July 1 of 2021. Um, we're currently exploring with MassDEP just what are our options going forward from here. Um, so what are the hurdles we have to take in 100% of our water from Andover? Right now in the winter, we can survive. So we have an, a, a, a permitted ability, a, a numerical limit of a million and a half gallons a day we can take from Andover. During the winter months, we're below that million and a half gallons a day. The other problem we have is we need to maintain enough chlorine in the water so when it gets all the way on the other side of town, we're not having microbes or any bacteria growing in our, in our pipes. During the winter time, the water's much cooler. The chlorine residual carries much further. So we're, we're actually able to, what we do, did last week when we took our plants offline for uh, maintenance, we're able to maintain the system just under our current permit drawing from Andover. As we get into April and May and people start to ramp up their irrigation and our water demand goes through the roof, it's much harder for us to meet just the volume demands then as the summer and the water temperature goes up, it's hard for us to maintain a chlorine residual to the end of the system. So there's a couple things we need to do before that point in order to uh, effectively deal with this in the long term. So we're exploring options with MassDEP to try and uh, bring back that date of July 1, 2021 to get us able to draw 100% of our water from Andover more quickly than then. Just a few points of edification. So these were tested previously and fell within the limits previously as well. The only, the only issue that you are seeing is that they're slightly above what the proposed limits are. So there is no requirement for us to test. The tests we took, we did not have to take. We elected to do that. We kind of went based on what we were hearing and saying, gee, this does seem to be an issue. We're taught hearing about that landfill bringing water to Lowell and you know and we're drawing from Andover we wanted to make sure that we were putting out water that's safe so yes we're currently meeting the drinking water standards there is a proposed standard out there and it seems to be at you know and I don't know if it's Flint Michigan and everything that went on there but there's a much more accelerated process right now to setting drinking water standards than there has been in the past it's definitely good to be proactive anyway about this but sure. what is the way to eliminate that or reduce that how is that reduced or eliminated by treatment or so by there chemicals? are means of treating uh, I don't know if I can get back there but Andover if you saw the Andover results uh, sorry about that. so this is Andover's raw water it dropped from nine and a half down to about four or you know 12 down to four in their finished water how are they getting that reduction there's a, a product out there called uh, granular activate activated carbon it's a filter material and you can pass water through that. It's good for taste, taking taste and odor. It's good for taking a lot of contaminants out of the drinking water. And one of the things they found is it is effective at taking PFAS out of the drinking water as well. So is, is um, so but you are retesting, do you have a plan in the, in the event they're retesting or the testing in these other areas that you get back in six or eight weeks? They're elevated. Do you have that plan in place to treat it, even though it's complies with current regulations, you want to get it under the proposed level. So carbon filtration, adding that into a system is a very expensive proposition mm -hmm. in the order of several million dollars, even for our relatively yeah. small wells. You so can't just use a Brita filter for this. Mm, <laughs> at, at the home level, you probably could, but we're not testing at the home. So we have to, we have to test what's going into the system and make sure it meets that. Um, One more thing just for the board's edification then. So, so we would want to know what your what what plan you might have available to atta attack this, but also, um, just out of my head. Um, do you uh, do you know where? I know you didn't look for this or test for this or try to figure this out, but do you have a, an idea of where the source of this is coming from? No, it's okay. it's hard to know. So these are parts per trillion. It's a very very low yeah. level, and okay. where it's coming from. 
it's hard to say. So I've used this example, and I don't know if people are going to understand it or not, but our wells are, are out in the woods a little bit. Generally, they're places that are not developed. If somebody doesn't want to comply with the town's ability to get rid of carpet by cutting it up and putting it out in three-foot sections with the carpet, it's possible people 20 years ago may have taken some carpeting out in the woods and just disposed of it there. And it's such a small level. It, you know, it doesn't take much getting into the water. Um, it, but it, it's it's such a widespread product. I have, you know, it's it's primarily if you think about the two, it's Dupont and it's 3M that were the primary manufacturers of these things. And if you guys remember, we had the MD, MTBE. I'm sure Steve might remember that. But 15 years ago or so, MTBE was it was a drink. It was a gasoline additive that was being found in a number of drinking water supplies. There was a na national class action lawsuit against the uh, the manufacturers and the town. You know, the town signed on to it, we didn't think much of it, and then we got like a $600,000 settlement. So there may be, may be something down the road where uh, they look at who is more responsible for this. Unfortunately, it's showing up. So uh, I know Danvers, uh, in Middleton, they found it in the drinking water. There's a number of communities, Hudson and a, a couple other communities just west of us, that are also uh, working with this. There's a number of issues. Uh, Merrimack and a couple other places in southern New Hampshire are also having issues. There was a, uh, a bottled water well company up in Haverhill that had to shut down their, their bottling plant just because they were finding PFAS as well. So it's, it's something that, again, in, in my 30 years in the drinking water, I've never seen something move this quickly in terms of uh, people responding to it. Members, I have a question. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just comments, I guess, and there may be some questions too. But uh, basically, you know, we're, this is not a, a good situation, but it's, uh, it's good in respect that, you know, we have a, an alternative source that we've already been tapping into yeah. and we'll maximize, you know, shortly uh, to address the situation so the drinking water in North Reading, uh, the future of the drinking water in North Reading is good, you know. Uh, so that's the good part. Um, the, the question is, and, and what we've talked about in the subcommittee, is to um, try and hasten the process of, of building these um, chlorination plants. Which again, apple before a house before the cart. You know what are we going to be doing? Are we going to wait until we get our permits from the state before we go and, and spend the money to do it and hedge our bets and just move forward? Um, but in light of this, you know we, we're going to have to start treating. If we're going to be drawing more water from Andover, we're going to have to treat it and chlorinate it. You know, in the summer months coming up shortly. So we're going to have to hasten that process and probably hasten the uh, the construction uh, guidelines. It's our hope that the state will cooperate with us and assist us in uh, expediting some of the permitting processes and, and move forward with us. But I think it's important to note that um, in the interim, you know, we're going to have to, DEP is going to play a role here, and, and they may make some sort of a declaration which causes us to, uh, allows us to draw beyond our permitted levels from Andover on a temporary basis. You mean like an emergency declaration? Correct. Right. You know, so they could have a, they, they may make an emergency declaration based upon these levels of PFAS. So, um, in doing so, it may impact our ability to allow people to water their lawns and things of that nature. But it will allow us to draw the water that we need, the volume that we need in the high demand months, on a short term basis for up to six months. Now, I don't anticipate we're going to be ready in six months to treat all the water that we have and have our permitting in place. We're probably in a nine to 12 month time period to have all our permitting in place and get construction underway. So just to make the board aware, we may be coming before this board and town meeting, or not town meeting because we already have the approval, but before this board uh, to inform you that we're gonna be moving the construction cycle up and hopefully uh, you know, if there is an emergency declaration, you know, people will be understanding and tolerant that it's, uh, you know, while the, the term might be somewhat yeah. of concern, mm -hmm. it really isn't of it. It's their mechanism to allow us to draw more than we need. So um, so things are moving in the right direction. We're, we have a great resource here. We're in better shape than some other communities who don't have secondary uh, sources. And, um, you know, so time, time, time will tell. But I think, you know, within the next 12 months, we're going to be in, in fairly good shape, and hopefully our permitting will be all in place. And I think Rob could probably better address that than I can. Any other members have questions? <clears throat> I'd just like to reiterate that the water's safe to drink. <laughs> just for anybody watching. I'm drinking it right now. Make a <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask what that problem was. It's a clear was. liquid. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I would just echo, so two of, you, two of you have used the term emergency declaration. And I know that sounds like a scary term. That is the state's official term that allows them to override their own regulations. It's not necessarily, oh, this is an, emer you know, we're, we're in a, a crisis mode here. Basically for DEP to say, yes, you can exceed your permit, they have to issue what they call an emergency declaration. So it is, that's a term that the public is going to hear over the next several months. As we're going to get into the summer months, and if we're not turning our own wells on, we're going to have to have some means in order to exceed that permit capacity. We're also going to need to do something. So we have our, our two interconnections. One comes through our, one of our pumping stations over at Central Street. We do have fairly quickly the ability to add chlorine at that location. Unfortunately, that's the smaller volume in terms of gallons per day. We can pull through that. So we're looking and we're asking Rob to look at the ability to put a temporary chlorination system on the Main Street uh, interconnection as well, just to be able to meet those summertime bacteria uh, issues that may arise. Okay. All right, any further questions, comments, or Mrs. Stoltz has a question, I think, or a comment. Um, when I'm offline, um, I have an MD So my question is this, that we have um, PFAS in particular as it might be coming to us for handovers. Do you have a microphone? So you want to use the mic so the people okay. at, at home can, can hear your question? Thanks. Um, having been interested in this for the last two years and having followed what Representative Moulton and other people have been working on, because since 2013 until their uh, permit came up for renewal, Yes, the leachate from the um, landfill in New Hampshire was going into the Merrimack at Lowell. Um, when we get water from Andover, is it, fr is it sourced from groundwater or is it diversion from the Merrimack or is there some of both? So Andover has a natural pond called Haggett's Pond. That, that's where their water treatment plant is located on. If you know where Raytheon is up on 133, oh, yes, my just kind of diagonally across from that is the Andover water source. Okay. So Andover draws from there. They also supplement that with water from what they call Fish Brook. Fish Brook drains down into the Merrimack River. Yeah, and I know where that they is. They also supplement the end of Fish Brook by pumping from the Merrimack River into an intake. Then they pump the combined Fish Brook Merrimack River water up into the far side of Haggett's Pond. So it blends with Haggett's Pond and then eventually makes its way into their treatment plant. Okay. The reason I asked is because I suspect you would have different levels of PFAS at average times with the different sources, and I would have guessed groundwater might be lower than the Merrimack. Um, and I would also guess in somewhere with the temperature gradient, it might or might not be different if it stratifies in different levels of water based on temperature and particularly not knowing when that 22.6 was obtained, I didn't know what that was going to mean in terms of either the level that you would get at our interconnection from Andover and or what we would need to do to stay under the 20, and that's why I was asking. So kind of the, the second to the left column, Andover interconnection, and then the other two, the Andover finish water, those are what we would kind of think we would be seeing from Andover. So we received, we got a 6.2 parts per trillion, Andover got a, you know, 3.7 and a 3.9 parts per trillion. So the water coming from Andover is already well below the 20 parts per trillion that we're anticipating. In November, but you were talking about whether or not we'd be pulling more from them over the summer. Right. So again, this is, as far as I'm, the, d the data I have, this is the only results we've seen from Andover. Okay. So we sampled them again last week. We will be monitoring that to see okay. what it is. Because I was assuming that if it's 11.8 in November in the summer, it might be higher. Uh, it, it's possible. So most, most, most of the uh, impact that I'm aware of is on groundwater systems more than surface water. Okay. So and over the, the report of the landfill taking in dumping at the low water treatment plant didn't ever take into account the dilution, just the strict, forget the treatment end of it at the wastewater treatment plant, the dilution factor going in there. So you're bringing, in, right. you're bringing in a truckload of P, PFAS water but you're putting it in the Merrimack River, which is a huge dilution factor. So even at the- Although it ran considerably under last year. 
but even at the lowest, I look back at 2016, which is a very drought year, took the lowest flow day of that, put the maximum volume they were allowed to take from the New Hampshire landfill into the Merrimack River, and it only contributed two parts per trillion to, uh, okay. to the total. So there are probably other sources because we're above two parts <coughs> per trillion in the Merrimack River, but it, we're, again, it looks like they're well below okay. the... Uh, Thank you, then I feel better. Thank you. Are you... Um, is this a good time to ask you about a wastewater update? <laughs> Where are we at with respect Not to, to ask that? Me, that those uh, matters. So I mentioned briefly uh, before I introduce Mark that we are going to meet with Andover on Wednesday and go over the infrastructure, our infrastructure needs in Andover in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish here. So, um, you know, we plan to spend a few hours over there and hash that out. And then we'll be able to send that information back with our consultants and do a lot of the legwork that needs to be done. So the next time we come for an update, I'll have some information for you on, on what's involved in Andover, what we need to be, that needs to be done. So Rob is here. Rob's going to give you uh, an update on the water interconnection that we had already been well underway before we even uh, we started talking about PFAS. He can give you an update on that and then give an update on some of the things that Mr. O'Leary talked about, expediting the permits and things like that. So we can give Rob a few minutes if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the uh, two things that we're working on that we've been talking about over the past year are, is the FEIR, which is the final um, report on the environmental conditions or impacts of, of your project. Um, that we have to submit, and once that's submitted and approved by MEPA, uh, the process for the interbasin transfer, um, th that acts as the application for the interbasin transfer permit to take over. Um, when I was here, I think, in, I think it was in November, I brought you a schedule, and we were targeting to have that complete and submitted by, I think it was the end of March, and then um, some of the people on the committee gave me an opportunity to expedite that, and now we're trying to shoot for mid-February, actually, to get that submitted. Um, we're working diligently. There was uh, one major task that um, we got saddled with that Andover chose not to take responsibility for or, or take upon themselves um, that's causing us a little grief. But uh, again, our intent is um, to submit that FEIR, we, we hope, by mid-February. Um, they, the MEPA has a submission process where once a month you can submit these types of reports. Um, we couldn't obviously hit uh, January, that would have been this week. So we're trying for February, um, worst case it would be March, but we're, we're pulling out all the stops to get that done. Um, the second project that we're working on, Mark had mentioned, was the cl uh, chlorination facilities. And that is to design small buildings uh, that will go at both Central Street and Main Street. And we're, that's where the Mark will have the um, capabilities to add chlorine. And those are going to be needed because when you finally go to Andover Water, the existing treatment plants will be taken offline. All the chemicals, those chemicals that are being added now there, won't, you won't have that capability anymore. So you'll need these stations. Um, our intent there was to, to design and bid that project um, probably mid mid spring or so that was our intent um, I actually had a team meeting uh, with our design team this morning and have gotten a commitment out of them to expedite that uh, by several weeks um, so we're hoping to be done and that almost ready to bid pending it's got to go to the state and I'm gonna want to talk about that in a second um, by no later I'm shoot I'm targeting right now the third week of February that we're going to be we will be almost in a position to put that project out to bid. So what does that mean? Now that, now that we've got this news, um, this all happened very quickly, um, and I just got an, an update to this uh, late last week. Um, so what we need to do, we scheduled a meeting uh, for Wednesday morning. Um, Pat, Mark, and I, some of my staff, um, I think Michael may take part as well, uh, with DEP, um, because we want to get in front of them um, as your consultant to find out what what um, what their thinking is when when do they want um, the town to actually switch over and what does that mean for your permit and um, the construction of these facilities um, tentatively like I said we're, we're um, targeted for Wednesday morning they need to hopefully we're going to get confirmation from them um, we're hoping that we can get some um, cooperation from them to expedite the review of the design documents for the 
chemical feed facilities. When we design that, we have to submit it to the state on your behalf. They have to review it. They comment on it. I think if they're um, if they're pushing the town to switch over to Andover fully, um, much quicker, almost a year quicker or more, um, we're hoping that they um, can help to expedite that process so we can get those facilities out in the street and construct it. So what does that mean in the interim um, while they're being built? Um, again, we just got wind of this last week, so we're talking now. Uh, Mark sort of introduced a little bit that we think we can use the existing Central Street facility through the summer that should facilitate, facilitate chlorination at that location. That's, again, assuming we go to Andover fully sometime soon this spring. Um, and then I think we can come up with a, well, we're going to come up with a plan for a temporary sort of mobile type system that we can put at Main Street. So that means Mark is going to be operating, you know, on systems that aren't all that optimum, but um, should be able to satisfy the requirements for rechlorination. Um, and he doesn't need to use it all the time, but he needs to have that ability to do it if uh, residual in the far ends of the system um, should su subside. Uh, and then we're going to, once we talk with um, DEP, then we got to get with them and re-engage Water Resources and MEPA to find out what the impacts are to the FEIR. It would seem, um, it would seem to us that this is going to happen. You're going to Andover and that um, there might be some leniency in how much effort we need to continue putting into the FEI permit so that we can expedite getting it submitted. That's our hope, it's something we're gonna talk about with the agencies um, to get that moving as well. So it's kind of a, a status of, of where those two projects are that we've been talking about for some time now. Again, I just wanna reiterate, you know, we're, um, it, it appears that you guys are gonna be connecting well in advance of when we really targeted doing it, which would have been next summer, um, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. So Does the members have questions? Comment or oh, all set. No, yeah. Other than that, I just want to comment that the effort that's being put in now is uh, yeoman's work. You know, I, I know the consultants are putting on an extra people to, to expedite this. Uh, you know, Mark, Pat, and, and Michael have been working you know, around the clock uh, right. to address the situation and uh, do it in a timely fashion to address you know our immediate concerns. So, you know, kudos to them and appreciate their efforts for sure. Yeah, we, we don't envy your position. We're doing everything we can to, to, to get you in a good, good place as quick as possible. Yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next to our business, we have on the agenda the review of the unaccept, unaccepted street improvement policy. And if the members recall, at the last meeting we were to submit our um, recommended revisions to the town administrator so that we could discuss anything in this meeting. Mr. Gilberto, do you have, did you receive any recommended revisions? I don't believe I've received any recommended revisions from the board members. Okay. Uh, I also recall, though, that there was a desire to hear some feedback from the Planning Commission, and unfortunately, they have not had a meeting um, since our last meeting. They are actually scheduled to meet tomorrow evening, so I've told the planner to expect that we'll forward the draft as it stands right now in the packet to the Planning Commission for, uh, for its review. I think I know the answer to this too, but with respect to Swan Pond, we're at status quo on that. We haven't, we're not, haven't received anything further on that. Uh, that's correct. I'm not aware of any change since the All board right. last discussed that specific project. But I do see that there are a couple of residents who are yes. here. If there's new information. We certainly would love to hear it. If there isn't, then we'll, we'll wait to hear it. No, I, we, we would just hope to hear what how the draft is coming and, um, it, and also I think we were also waiting for feedback from DPW as to, you know, final work uh, construction costs. So we, we're just kind of in the moment, I guess. But the moment. Okay. 
Mr. Schultz. Guys, ha have you guys met as a group since our last meeting? I uh, know. It's important that you do. Mm -hmm. We got to make sure you guys are all together on this, otherwise it's not going to work. So please, if you can get together and just even we gave you some rough ideas on numbers, kind of talk amongst yourselves and come back to us with like, cause, cause if you guys aren't unified, yeah. I don't know how we do this. And I want to help you guys out, but you got that one person in the middle still. Right. You guys got to meet and figure that out. Yeah, it's difficult to, I think we are together as far as, mm -hmm. yes, you, yeah. know, you know, that one person in the middle. Um, I think you have to have a meeting with everybody in the same room and have that discussion. I think it's important. Uh, well, I mean, however we come together as a group, yeah. you know, we, we do. But, you know, also, uh, you know, from our perspective, you know, we need some, we need some hard numbers. But I think we've given you guys plenty of guidance of what we're willing to do here. And it, it's time for you guys to kind of get together and say, yeah, we're either together or we're not. Because we're spending a lot of time on this policy. We want to help you. But you guys have to be unified. If you got that one guy in the middle is always going to say no, yeah. even if someone else is going to pay for it, just tell us now and save us the time. Well, I don't, and I think the policy, is, your approval was already received at the uh, town, town meeting, so you're not waiting on our policy. Our policy was more of a, an after effect of your yeah. scenario, which I don't even think your scenario would, you know. We want to know we can help you. That's um, all. But, but in any event, what is it the is it the one individual doesn't want to sign off on the project or I thought we already agreed that, that we were just gonna work around that one property or two properties. In other words it was gonna go so fast, no. stop no one. Well that's no. what we talked about. I've never agreed to that. So I'm not gonna pay part of a road stop, pave another part of a road. That's silly. We gotta get everybody on board. It's so I've, silly about it. I it, it's silly. Okay. I it, it just will. is. That's because you're saying it's silly, but it may be done. I'm not voting. Yeah, for it. let's let's okay. not. But we need to. But it's just, just, just No, no. Let me just we say, can get some clarification yeah. from. Mr. We just made to make sure you guys are all on board. Mr. Schultz. We spent so much time. Mi on this. Mr. Schultz, right. we can get some clarification from Mr. Gilberto. I don't have that same recollection either. I think yeah. the expectation was something different, but let's get it clarified. I know this is putting you on the spot, Mr. Gilberto, but they are here and. It's kind of a segue to our policy. It's not your scenarios are reliant upon our policy. It was already it was already given the stamp of approval, mm -hmm. provided that you complied with the contingencies that the board had imposed. And I think some of those contingencies required everyone's sign off and waiver or release. I think was the issue. And even if you had all agreed that you were going to contribute his portion of that mm -hmm. amount. He would need to say yes, it's okay because we were not able to stop and go in terms of the contracting. That's my recollection, but please let let Mr. Gilbert, if he can, uh, <laughs> refresh our recollection on that. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I hope that you I don't can. remember. <laughs> no, it's not that I don't remember it. I think that mm -hmm. you know we, we know that we we have a three hundred fifty thousand dollar project here. The town's portion of one hundred seventy five thousand dollars has been authorized. There would be a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar portion required by virtue of a commitment um, by the abutting property owners, and I think we've talked that we don't necessarily we aren't concerned what the source of that funding is, only that we have that total amount. Right. I think there are some unanswered questions about how much we want up front versus how much we want along the way. I think there is an unanswered question about whether or not we are doing the entire length that was originally envisioned or whether we are going to do portions of it. Um, I've, we jumped on this policy because we thought that there might be an opportunity for it to apply with regard to this project, but I think there are some challenges on the front end of that policy because we've moved further along. So, I mean, that's the, the best I can provide in terms of uh, a status at this point. I, I do think an important question is going to be, are we willing to consider the stretch without all of the sign-offs and, and sort of interrupting the paving. Yeah. And I don't think we've there's, decided that at this there, point. Theirs, though, was given the seal of move, move forward. Uh, I think it was given the, the unanimous approval of the board in a town meeting. It was it was given the approval. It wasn't contingent upon us coming up with the policy. And we're, we're, we're ready to proceed, but yeah. I, I think yeah. there is an unanswered question about whether we're doing the whole stretch or... Okay. So the maybe, that, maybe your, that particular thing <coughs> should go on to an agenda for mm -hmm. another meeting to flesh those questions out. Because I wasn't aware there were these kind of issues with it. Well, and, and <coughs> the, the, the last thing is, you know, there's still the question of, what is the 
what the actual cost would be. There were some things that, you know, I think DPW was going to come in engineering to, to really come out and say, oh yeah, well, you know, this drainage can be done in a different manner so that the cost, those contingencies were, you know, way off the charts. And so most likely it wasn't going to be that high of an amount. And so we're kind of waiting to get back. It's 175. Yeah, See if you can round up 175. If it comes in less, you got money coming back. But this is kind of what yeah, we said yeah, the last it's meeting. It's hard though. To, to, to say, okay, you come up with 175,000 dollars, and then, and the, but then we'll let you know if we give you money back. That's how the policy and works. Though. We want to help you, but you guys have to help yourselves too. No, no, we. Yeah. I understand. I really want to get that road paved. I really do. So. But We're telling saying, you what the number all right, is, Mr. Schultz. Yeah. Let's not. Saying, let's one at a time. All, all I'm saying it's is not there. This, the cost had all these contingencies in it. So we would, with the understanding that the DPW is, is in engineering is going to look <coughs> at it and, and give us, come back to us and say, this is what the actual cost will be, and this is what we will expect from the residents. So no, it's just not how it works. I mean, again, I, I, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but. Yeah. It's 175 is what they told us so is, is your share, yeah, you, the resident's share. And if it comes in less, great, you guys will get that back to you. But if you want the project, mm -hmm. you got to get everybody together, everybody has to give authorization, and you got to come up with 175. But, but, but why do you have an issue with, with us being given a, a number? Because you're trying, the cost. you're trying to renegotiate the cost. We're only going on the cost. I'm trying to answer you. Yeah. We're only going on the cost that DPW is telling you. We're not making the cost up. We're going on what our people are telling us. No. You want to renegotiate the cost, but we're already paying half. And there's a lot of people in town that don't think we should even be doing that. Yeah, but hopefully the town we have to pay that 175. Right. Right now, you're not, you know, you're, right. you're holding, right, holding that aside, free cash or whatever. Um, and hopefully it won't be that much for the town either. If you want to get it done, that's what you have to do. I mean, that's what we, right. we come well, up with. And let, let's, okay. yeah. I, I, we, we, I wish I did, I wish <laughs> we didn't let Mr. Power go, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Gilbert. So, so I, I know I put you on the spot, but they are here. And yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm reading from. It's helpful to address, even though their situation isn't on the agenda, sure. and perhaps we should put it on or get a list of questions, but it, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilberto. Maybe so, so one, one thing is very clear because this is in the motion that was approved at town meeting. Yes. No money can be expended from that town's portion until we receive $175,000. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot expend $1 at this point. Um, I, I do think there is a question with regard to, for us to properly design the system, are we doing all of the properties or will there be an interruption? I, I do think we need to know the answer to that question. So if that requires further discussion yes. at a board meeting on the earlier side of an agenda with the residents invited, then we can do that. Well, if I the think board Mr. Would Bauer told us no to that. You said so it, that it, wasn't it would ruin option. the character. That's fair. So yeah. it, it's not his recommendation. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's right. fair. Right. So I don't. That wasn't, it wasn't an issue. And I also think that the contingencies built in are because of the fact that it's a public construction contract. And I do recall when you had taken a look at it and you had different estimates, that those estimates might be different than what the town is obligated to estimate for a public, because this would be using public funds. And so there are required contingencies built in. That was on the, I do also specifically recall thinking that was a low estimate for a public roadway construction project and Mr. Bauer commented on that at the, at the amount that it came in at. So those are factors that he had to incorporate into his estimate. Even if you picked it apart by someone else, there are certain things that have to be included in there as contingencies because it's public construction. And we did talk about that. And I don't think it's gonna differ from what his estimate is, except that it might be higher the longer that we wait. Because as these contracts and public construction contracts go, the longer the time goes by, there's other factors that come into play and the estimate may not be accurate. So, um, yes. The meeting that we had with Mr. Roberto, people that live out there. Uh, the, uh, there was that, that one person that would, wouldn't, wouldn't sign off. 
And then before that, there was a question that I think Mr. Bauer had with the property before that. So we discussed that it might not go as far as we thought. It might stop at the property before and may not go the rest of the way, or it may stop at the property before and then jump and pick up again. So we were waiting, if, if that, obviously if that's the case, but it stops at that property and then doesn't go the rest of the way down the road, that would be a significant difference in the price. Right, so, so in so other words, it would be paid, instead of maybe paying a, a half mile, mm -hmm. it's only paid uh, a quarter of a mile. Yeah. You know, so at least you get some portion of the road. But this is where you guys have to decide as a group. That's why I keep coming back to. You gotta tell us what your group wants to do. Yeah. Oh, I don't know I'm exactly. Sorry. I mean, that's an option. That could work. So if that's an option. And that would be less cost. But you guys gotta come back to us. That actually would go fly in the face of the town warrant. Mm -hmm. Probably have to do another article at different town meetings. But now we're changing the length of that we're doing. So, but let us know. That's what I'm saying. You guys have to meet and give us some direction. I don't know exactly what you're looking to do right now. Mrs. Gonzalez has her hand has had her hand raised. Please, just to clarify, I was at that meeting. Um, and that is how I remember it. Too. How you are remembering it is how I am remembering it. Um, there was no clarification of whether it was going all the way or not. So I think there does have to be a conversation. And maybe, I don't know, Mr. Gilberto, we can maybe have one of those meetings again. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure DBW will be willing to clarify all of that. To, to meet with them. Um, yeah. You, you know, I, I think this. The motion that I'm referring to occurred after two, I think two or even three neighborhood meetings that we had here, um, including the one that you were at. Um, so I, you know, we can we can get get that feedback and. If that's know. what you feel like is holding things up, then let's get that going. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Okay. okay. I, I guess my last thing, and I, I would just uh, uh, make a plea to the board uh, <coughs> to to. I guess I would question why we would have to go to the whole town meeting again. Because you, you know, have a $350,000 project that was appropriated for a certain, I believe, did the article say a certain length of road? No. The, the motion calls it to replace a 2,700-foot portion of the gravel area known as Swamp Pond. So we're not doing 2,700. I don't know. We just up put two. But without going for more, we yeah. should go for less. Yeah, up, up to. So up to. If it's up to, then we could probably up do two. something different. But you guys have to be unified okay. and tell us. We don't know. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so thank you for thank you. your um, input. And then we do, we should then have that as another, if there's another meeting and we can get an update on those questions answered, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think that your scenario is waiting on a policy. I no. think the policy came as a result of your scenario to try to help others in the same predicament. And you know, set some parameters up for others. You already went to town meeting with a petition and it already was approved as a warrant. So, um, but having said that, I think the policy also is sufficiently broad to allow us to come up as a board with other solutions to scenarios. And I don't know if there is any other, we, we've looked at it, I think we've had a second read through and at our second read through, I think there was some commentary by the members that, and then we had agreed that we would um, provide comment, but that also Mr. Gilberto, as he said, would have it reviewed by town officials. So I think yeah. we're gonna need to we're look at it again. The CBC. We're waiting for the CBC. Yeah. Yeah. That's so I let's, let's maybe, you so know, if the, let's see what if the board's in agreement, obviously we're gonna wanna have some of the, uh, some th to have their input on it. Quick question, Kate. Just yeah, so I know from you guys, have you guys discussed the op, the the option of just paving up to the? Yeah. What are what are the people? I say beyond the gap. I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, what are their thoughts on well, it? Well, obviously we, we, beyond the gap, we'd love to have it really be paved. But if, um, if it's not going to be feasible, uh, you know, if the town would leave that section, um, then it's still a good result. Right, but have you had this discussion? With, I guess when they're going to be upset if they're in front of their houses getting paved. Uh, no, no. I mean, they, they would hope that it would get paved yeah. in front of their house. And do you but think the person that's the problem, if he's not paying for it, he or she isn't paying for it, they'll play ball, or they'll just be difficult to be difficult? Yeah. I, I don't think that they're going to change. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I know mean, you've been trying. I'm not going to make a comment like that. But yeah. clearly, they, we have, we, I do recall this, we have to go across, the road already goes across that person's land. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So yeah. the city has, I mean, the town has to be yeah. permitted yeah. to go across that land. And if that person is saying no, mm -hmm. we can't just plow right through. Right. And so, I mean, honestly, this was uh, good tonight to hear this from you because I think if it gets paved up to that point, that's still a substantial improvement. Um, and so it, it would be helpful. And then I think it's also beneficial for the town because it would be that much less that the town would have to pay. And just keep in mind, it's not going to be a percentage difference in price. It depends on where the stormwater is. and well, it, If you do have it, it may not be half the price. It depends on, yeah. we got to let DPW probably do an estimate, I would think, right, Michael? So is that, is that, should I talk with Patrick, uh, you know, is as far as if, if, if we, as a group say, yeah, that's the option we should try to go for, you know, that it's only paved up to that point. How do we get then what, what the cost estimate would be? If they, they can just look at the engineering study and determine that, I assume. Go with that to Michael. Yeah. yeah. Through you, Madam Chair, yes. we're, we're going to have to look at that. I mean, okay, the, yeah. the mo I'm looking at the motion from town meeting, and if it's the motion that was approved, which I believe it was, it, it's fairly instructive and restrictive to, to a 2,700 foot length being repaved with $175,000 being contributed up front. So uh, we're going to have to figure out. It's not up to? It doesn't say up to. So we need to, we need to do a new motion at town meeting if that's the approach you want to take. construct a new paved roadway to replace a 2,700-foot portion of the gravel area known as Swan Pond Road. So we're going to have to figure out how we might be able to update the stormwater based on the scope. Um, it's not it's not on the docket to get paved this construction season, at least not at this time. And, and if there were an issue with ramp scaling that back and we needed to I think we have an opportunity to do so All right. um, but you know we need to we need to figure that out okay um, we do have to move on to on the agenda so thank you for your input okay. and we thank will you. need to have those we'll work for, on for, for next steps I do think it would be good for the Public Works Director Miss um, Gravada and and, uh, and myself to meet just to talk and then we could do another neighborhood meeting in here if we think that's possible okay okay Thank you, and Thank just you. to alert you, they're chasing your heels as to the number of meetings attended. So <laughs> you still hold the record, however. <laughs> Thank, you. Um, Thank you. Okay, so we'll um, they have move, move along they from that <laughs> at this point. We don't. We're not ready to, to take a uh, take any action on that. Um, likewise, number eight. I think we're. I think I addressed that in the board members' report, so I think we can move along on number eight if the members agree. So we can move on to number nine. I have a motion. Ratify the community compact grant application. There was uh, an explanation of that in our packet, and if Mr. Gilberto wants to expound upon that in maybe three sentences or less. look I'm getting right now <laughs> ladies you are dismissed this evening oh I know thank yes. you for thank your time thank you so much for you don't have to go home but you can't stay here and, <laughs> and if it hasn't this been said before like a vacation because it's 9 30 too by the way so thank you guys you. are the best if it hasn't been said before thank you thank you um so the, the state's community compact grant program which the town has taken advantage of on a few occasions in the past has uh, opened up another round of grant funding. Um, unfortunately for us, the grant funding opened up the day after our last meeting, December 17th. Um, fortunately for you, or at the risk of getting my wrist slapped, um, I asked the town planner to, um, to submit applications for two projects subject to ratification here this evening, um, which we don't normally do with the community compact. Um, we have done it for other programs, but for this program, we don't generally do so. So the first is an age-friendly action plan. It's a $35,000 grant request, which is effectively intended to um, help us develop an implementation plan uh, as a member of the AARP network of age-friendly states and communities. And we are optimistic that we'll uh, receive an award, but don't know uh, as of yet that we'll receive it. Um, our hope is that we'll have an answer um, prior to the February 10th meeting and that we might be able to schedule uh, a more formal recognition of our designation as an AARP age-friendly community. 
um, with some members of the Council on Aging here. So that's the first grant, and it's really intended to build on work that's already occurred in the community and come up with a plan for implementation. Uh, we're not starting from scratch. There's a lot of work that's been done. Uh, Mr. Warner, I know you've been part of it in your role with the SSAT and the Council on Aging. And there's some other work that's also occurred through the master planning process. So we would sort of bring all of that together and have a plan to, to move this forward. Um, one of the things that it will look at too is the staffing and you know, where we might need assistance in, in implementing that plan as well. So we look forward to that recommendation. And we hope that we may have something for the June town meeting, but uh, time is getting tight with each passing week. And the second is uh, with regard to the property on Carpenter Drive. Um, it's just about a year ago that this board had some conversation relative to that, pro that property. And um, we have made some, um, what I will say are extensive efforts to work with the Mass Housing Partnership to try to implement the plan there. It does not appear that there is a program that will meet our need. So we've uh, submitted a $25,000 request for funding to, do, uh, to, to move forward our own strategic plan for that property. Um, to have some technical assistance with developing a request for proposals and going to the market to, to obtain proposals, much in the way we did for the Berry property, uh, but on a smaller scale. So um, we're excited at these two opportunities. These are two projects that I think are near and dear to the board's strategic plan and to our goals, um, not just from this past fall, but over the past five years. And we would ask for a vote from the board and prepare a motion accordingly. And the Carpenter Drive is for a portable or um, affordable housing production with an eye towards senior citizens. Elder, elderly housing, yes. Uh, that, Mr. Schultz. That's the property. We, uh, Mary Same property. And I, and, and we walked it off like last spring. Correct. They never got back to us? Uh, there does not appear to be a program that's available from them to, to proceed. Did they ever get back to us at all? Not to my knowledge. Okay, because I just want to say on the record, I, I do find it disconcerting because we are appealing one of their decisions, and I wish they, were, or they weren't going to take that against us when they didn't get back to us. I do, I do want to state that on the record. It is disappointing. We did wait for guidance from them. I was promised by the representative we would have it shortly, and it sounds like we never did. So It didn't materialize. No. That's but we found another funding source and another program, and Great. we hope to move forward. Great. Thank Any you. other questions? Um, Mr. Gilberto, do I have a motion? There is one in the packet, I believe, Ms. Gonzalez. Madam Chair, I move to ratify the community contact application for an age-friendly action plan and affordable housing. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Walner. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. I'd like to thank the town planner, the uh, Council on Aging director, um, and um, members of the Council on Aging for their feedback as well as Mr. Walner as we work through this process. We've got a couple of meetings and some electronic correspondence to get to this point, so we're optimistic. That's great. Thank you. Great. Um, <laughs> okay. Can, um, can, we, can we do? Okay, sure. Next, next, next order of business is uh, legal bill. Madam Chair, in Slepin Gonzalez's yeah. <laughs> absence. I move to approve legal bills for November 2019 in the amount of $12,774.44 as follows. Coltman and Page PC General 5420.94, Coltman and Page Labor 4387.50, 20 Elm Street 40B Project 1950, Thompson West $1,016 for again for a total of $12,774.44. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And one absent. Um, the next item on the agenda is to review the comment, to review the comments and feedback that the members have provided to Mr. Gilberto <coughs> based on our, poli our uh, committee. We were reviewing the tasks assigned to this committee, Wastewater and Wastewater Planning Advisory Committee so that we could get it up and running again, um, which I think is no better time than the present, huh? So I would like Mr. Gilberto to talk about any of the comments that... I had no feedback that I received uh, in between the two meetings, so uh, the draft stands as it was reviewed at the December 16th meeting okay. at this point. The draft is actually... The what's, previous. What, what currently exists. So, so correct. It's, so a, it's no, a, no recommendations for changes, <coughs> in other words, by the That's members. That's correct. <coughs> All right. Yeah, I, sh I should say, I'm saying draft, but it, it is actually in effect as yeah, constituted on this paper. That's correct. Right. It's not a draft. And, there and the only thing I think we did, I'm sorry. I thought we did give some feedback. Well, we did at the last meeting. We remember we made it just wastewater or not. Did we make those changes? No. So there was a discussion and then it ended with send comments back. So I, right. you know, 
I, I haven't received anything further, but I'm happy to go back to the meeting and make those adjustments from the meeting if that's what the board members would like me to work on. No, I don't think we were on a consensus on no. modifying that. So. The only comment I... Mr. O'Leary? Yeah. No, I, th I thought we were. What is... What it was done, yeah. What is done and the, the effort that's going to be needed going forward is going to be for wastewater. The water is taken care of. You know, that's just build the plants, do the other thing. We're all set there. So I think it's... Uh, that the consensus was let's just concentrate on what the issue is, and the issue is wastewater. That was that was my my impression. Well. Right. It was yeah. too broad. Yeah. What? It was too broad. Yeah. yeah. Covering too much ground. Yeah. So, in other words, you you wanted it revised to read that it's just a wastewater committee now, not a water and wastewater committee. Right, because the water issue has been resolved. You know, it, now we would, it just comes down to the permitting process. So we're going to have the permits to draw up to a certain amount, and then, you know, construction of the chlorination plants and all the rest, and if we're going to be drawing more, we'll have the capacity to draw up to whatever the new limits are going to be. So the, that's, there's nothing left to discuss there. No, and I don't think there's a need to revise it because their, ta their task would now be moving on to wastewater, which is the charge of this committee anyway, as contained in what's already in place. Sure. So, that was, I, my recollection is the same as Mr. Yeah, O'Leary's. I, I guess, you know, yeah. just, Maybe just to semantics. follow up a little bit, it is, is, is the, yeah. uh, to, to me, and again, I'll state again, I think it's still a little bit premature, but so be it. If the majority board's going to move forward, to me, then, you know, let's just tailor the mission statement to what we need. And even if we have to reconstitute it or reenact it or, uh, reactivate it yeah. under this guise. Let's let's reactivate it under the guise of the needs uh, that, that we have specifically, which is just wastewater. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's uh, and again we can if we have some members who are not meeting but are standing members of the committee at this point, then we can reconstitute it and revise the mission statement appropriately and direct them appropriately. And Mm -hmm. I think we Get have the no, nonsense out of that. We have no members now because okay. the terms that were, were right. all expired. Yeah, so, so again, we have the opportunity, and you know, if the majority wishes to move forward on it, then let's just tailor it to what we really need, um, reconstitute the mission to specifically to what we're looking for and, and okay. move on. So I In think the water then? aspect should be... Fine. Eliminated, you're saying. Uh, is that the consensus of the members? Yeah, can I make so, another point? What I think one of the things we, I don't know if tonight's tonight to discuss this or not, but what stakeholders do we want to be on this committee? Maybe that's something for a different day, I'm not sure, but like. Yeah, I think I think we should talk about that on another okay. day. I think it's on the agenda for our, the revisions that we agreed to provide to the TA after the last meeting. So I guess if it's as, just a simple modification that the majority of the board thinks should be made, then maybe we can revisit the, f the final version of that at the, at the next meeting. And then meeting. talk about what stakeholders And then we talk about reactivating and who, sh who should belong yeah. on it. Mr. <laughs> but much in that same way, I, I, I take that feedback along with yeah. what I heard at the last meeting. And <coughs> maybe what we'll do is we'll transcribe this into a track changes document. We can show you what, what changed. Yes. And if you want to build on that discussion at the last meeting, you'll be right. positioned to do so. This isn't a major, of course wastewater is a major issue, but revising this mm -hmm. for a different mission statement, I don't think we should be, have to talk about it over and over and over and over again. We've talked about it now for three meetings, so <laughs> I think we can move on from this, fix it or revise it. Let's talk about reactivating the committee at the next meeting. So, okay. Madam Chair, three, we'll, we'll have that draft that we think is going to get that the, sure. the draft of the current charge modified for a final action on February 10th. So Thank you. two two meetings, yes. this this next meeting to review, the meeting after the vote to, to finalize. Right, because it's re we have to go through two read-throughs of it, sure. Okay, we need to uh, move on to the next item, item on the agenda, which is to review our board meeting schedule. Madam Chair, through you uh, with the administrative staff, here in the town hall as well as with the finance director we have looked at the upcoming calendar and um, our recommendation to the board is to schedule meetings next meeting being january 27th and then have the february meetings be february 10th and 24th with the saturday budget meeting occur occurring on saturday 
February 29th. And then moving to the next meetings in March on the 9th and 23rd for budgets and regular business. 10th and 24th, yes. And then moving into April. Um, and, and 29th. And then we have a, yeah, we, 29th is, an all, is basically an all day Saturday session. Right. It's an all day? <laughs> well, no, all day. Well, it, it tends to run all day. Until right. <laughs> 1 o'clock, <laughs> from 8 to 1, 8 to 2, you know. Eight to one. One yeah. of two hockey are asking bring for an early end breakfast. that day. That's for yeah. lunch. That's, That's the budget. The um, That's the 29th. Saturday. That meeting is when we review the departmental, different departmental requests for, for budgets. And, so and the department head that offers to bring in Danish and donuts and stuff like that gets <laughs> to be heard <laughs> first. Mm -hmm. so. Is that how we that works? I know you always order it. Yeah, that's a deal. Yeah, that, that meeting usually starts at 8 a.m. Begins at 8 o'clock, yes. that's correct, yeah. here in this room, and it is televised. It's about five five hours. Yes. So. Um, <laughs> Madam Chair, through you, um, the past two years we've gone to having budgets over the course of three Monday evenings. You can see that I've designated April 6th as a, uh, an if-needed meeting. I'm going to try to work with the finance director to schedule the budget Budget, departmental budget reviews into two meetings as they customarily were prior to two years ago. Um, honestly, I, I think the only reason it changed is because I added a third meeting. There was, really wasn't any reason other than that. I do think it's possible for us to get through them in two meetings because I think we've done it in the past, but excluding the Saturday meeting, obviously, right. as a standalone. So um, that six, we asked the board members to hold that date, but we're not sure whether we'll need the meeting and whether or not it will include budget hearings or not. With the meeting following being on the April 13th, and then May 4th and May 18th. I'm going to miss that one. I won't be here. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did have Christmas tree collection over the weekend. There were a number of streets that I'm told were missed, and um, we welcome folks reporting that to the Department of Public Works. Um, secondly, the employee recognition luncheon will be held on Friday, February 7th at 12 noon at Hillview to accommodate the event. Town Hall, and my computer just died. Town Hall uh, will close at 12 o'clock noon, as well as will um, the Senior Center. And thank you, Ms. Brooks. Um, the library will close briefly during the day, I believe from 12 to 1.30, to allow staff to attend. And it should, I believe it reopens at 1.30 that day and is open for the rest of the business day. Um, so I just want to put that out there. We'll put something on the website to make folks aware so that they can plan accordingly. Um, it's an opportunity for us to um, provide some recognition for our employees and thank them for their service. Um, we, you know, we'll, we look forward to doing that again. Um, normally I've done that in the fall. We weren't able to schedule it. Um, for this uh, past fall, but we've got it scheduled here for February. We'd look to have another one again in the fall back on the regular schedule. Third, there is a need for citizen volunteers for the Board of Appeals, Conservation Commission, and Library Trustees. Um, we did notify the newspaper and have posted something on the town's website, and we encourage the public to take a look at those vacancies um, for both regular uh, and associate members, depending upon the board. Um, fourth, um, we have, uh, we're have we in the process of a soft opening, if you will, for a town hall Facebook page. Um, so uh, this is uh, something, like that we've good. <laughs> something that we've been working on to communicate. I, I can see it. It was recently accepted to the two more um, visible discussion groups in town, the Community Connection and what happens in North Reading. So I see it rolling out as responding to things as they come up. Um, maybe first, so that, that's why I'm saying a soft opening. Are you going to be the face of it? Uh, I, I, it will be used by, uh, <laughs> by town employees as needed, not necessarily only by me. Um, but um, I can tell you I'm not a Facebook expert. Uh, but I, You're I going to put community certain, alerts I'm up. certainly learning, and, and yeah. the intention is to, first and foremost, put information out there for people as an, in another form, but also where appropriate to sort of clarify where there's questions and direct people in the community to the right resources to be able to address their concerns because I know that can be useful and making a phone call on a Saturday night isn't often the, the answer. You know, so to another tool that we've looked at, um, again, I say a soft opening because there are best practices out there that call for extensive policies 
and a number of different regulation of it, but this is sort of intended to have a presence, you know, and a little bit of putting our feet in the water to figure it out, but I think it'll serve the community well. Um, and I appreciate the board member's support and understanding when I make the first mistake doing it. <laughs> um, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and and finally, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> and finally, um, you know, I'm going to just note that there is a um, there's a retired town employee who is in need of our thoughts and prayers. I'm not going to identify um, that person at this point in time, but I just would ask uh, that we keep. Um, keep someone in our prayers and thoughts and, and um, you know out of respect for everyone's privacy I'm not going to name the person but um, they have an unexpected turn in their health and they need they need um, they need everything we can give them so I just ask everyone to consider that thank you very much thank you, thank you. any questions for the TA or I think we've covered everything all the new business Mr. O'Leary uh, just one thing uh, recent articles uh, the globe and then also online and stuff and a lot of uh, discussion regarding recycling of clothing and some of the communities that the canvas is now taking it on too. Yeah, the pink uh, bags. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's something we should <laughs> uh, other than getting you some power here. Yeah, I th just think it's something we should take a look at have DPW uh, take a look and see what the feasibility of it is and see if this we can expand the recycling program and obviously it's a um, it's an issue that we should be concerned about, and if we can participate at a reasonable level and um, start engaging in it, you know, at least like to have the administration take a look at it and report back to us, you know, what would it take uh, to get involved with it. So it's a major environmental issue, and I think it's something that uh, the general public here in North Reading would be interested in, and I think if we can participate, we should. Other than that, I'll set. So I brought forward earlier, I think we should be reviewing our policy about appointments and committees. Um, it's been written down and I think we should be uh, spending time reviewing it because I think that there is good information in there. It is a po we do have policies and procedures that we should be following or modifying as we need to. But I, I think to ignore this is like a huge mistake. So I'd just like to know where the board is at with um, doing some work on this. I, again, we've talked. We've talked about this now ad nauseum. We're not ignoring policies. Is there anything else for comment? But but we're not following the policies we have. Or in what way? If you read through it, you would know. Do you have any other comments? We're not debating you right All now. Right. Do you have Let, any other comments? Let's not. No. You know what? Are we just? I, I are, guess. Are I'm, you making a recommend? Are you recommending a change in our policy? I'm recommending we review this, and yes, we change it. We okay. review the policy for appropriateness and make sure it's exactly where we okay. want it to be. So I think if you're making a policy, a recommending a policy change, that should be submitted, and that would go on a dock for the board to consider. So that's what you should do. If you think there's a change that needs to be made, then that's something you have every ability to do anything else you don't think you have any part nobody else has any part to make their comments or contribute your comments to me so I can summate what you're thinking we would if we took it up at a meeting for review that's what I'm proposing okay, okay. so put your comments together and submit it and if people think it needs to be changed then it would go under consideration by the board to change a board policy Okay. I, I, I would be happy to uh, offer my comments as to where I think there needs some uh, updating and uh, modifications and uh, clarifications. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, it sounds as though the majority is okay with the policies as written. I, I don't want yeah, to make that, a wrong it, assumption. It, this is, you know, no, it'll, it'll, it'll okay be new business. So, no, it, so we, we're not on the agenda to talk about no, policy. No, 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 no. You said bring it up. So, I mean, if you want to, uh, so I'm yeah, assuming you're okay on, with the policies as they're currently so, written. And if right. someone wants to make a proposal, uh, it'll be considered as an agenda item. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Schultz. I'd like to make I'm, a point. I'm sorry, Mr. Walner, are you all set? Just that once we agree to it, of course, I mean, this exists right now, so we're supposed to be complying with what exists. And then we can be Mr. Walner, Am we I? have beat this to death now. We have talked about this. We had town council provide an opinion on this. 
a policy is in place as a guideline. We did not violate a policy. We, we simply did not. We did not ignore a policy. A policy is a guideline. It's not a law. It's not our charter. We did not violate the law or the charter. That is simply put the end of the story. That's the fact. So why do we have procedures? Though? Why do we even have this? this? You're saying this is meaningless. No one yeah. said it was meaningless. Nobody said it was said meaningless. It was, you just told me it was meaningless. So if it's either okay. do we have We're going to end this balance? discussion because it's just going in a circle and we're not getting to a result. If your resolution is to propose a change to the policy, of course that has to be proposed to the board and the board has to review it and make a recommendation and, and make a vote on it actually to make a policy change. So that's the process. So okay. but is it, is there's it, nothing more for me to say to you other than if you want to make a recommended revision to this, and Mr. O'Leary said he would help with that. He I would, just said I have some comments that I'd be more than willing yeah. to contribute, absolutely. Definitely. Then that, that should be under review. So do that. So is there anything else for your old and new business that you wish to discuss? No. Mr. Schultz. I'm a little concerned with a few things, and I bit my lip a lot tonight. I'm going to bite my lip now. Yeah, so. Because I just, I don't think we need to be grandstanding for three hours. And I'm speaking to two gentlemen to my left. I don't need somebody. I, I'd I'm, rather you not. I get to finish. I'd rather you not. It's going to be really brief. Just address. I don't need someone to give me a copy of a policy that I already know. And at the last meeting, you didn't know. Because you didn't even know to interview the people. So I have the policy. I've read it. I follow it. And I don't need someone to grandstand in front of the public and parade witnesses in. The people elected us to get stuff done, not to get up here and grandstand and protect our family or protect this person and that person. We need to get stuff done. We have a lot of stuff on our agenda. It's very important we focus on that and stop the personal attacks and the grandstanding. It's got to stop. That's all I have. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Okay, I'm good. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Well, I'll make a motion. I'll second it. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.